Well, my name is Steve Duncan, and uh, I like to go into tunnels. I like to explore urban layers and track down lost streams. And I want to tell you a bit about that, show you a few pictures, and tell you about one of the uh, the three, uh, one of, one of the, the most scared moments, one of the top three most scared moments I've ever had underground. And I want to try to convince you all that uh, <laughs> all of you should explore urban tunnels as well, at least a little bit. Um, and keep that in mind. I'm trying to start a movement here because occasionally in what I do, I get arrested and very occasionally, and much more often than that, I get picked up by people who think what I'm doing is suspect. And so I'm trying to convince more people to go around and peer down manhole covers and look for lost urban waterways and that kind of thing so that I don't look like so much of a crackpot when I do it. So let me show you a few pictures first just to show you the sort of thing I'm talking about. Uh, these are from some of the, the tunnels that I've been in most recently, actually, just over the past few weeks. So these are sewer tunnels underneath Brooklyn. Uh, this is a, a 19th century sewer outletting into the Gowanus Canal. This is a six foot diameter brick sewer from 1890. And uh, this is where it joins with a 12 foot diameter storm drain in a confluence chamber just at the head of the Gowanus Canal. Uh, and this is where it overflows every time it rains, which is part of why the Gowanus Canal is so famously uh, putrid. Uh, this is a, actually, this is a tunnel I've been trying to get into for over a half dozen years. This is a 15-foot diameter brick sewer underneath Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. And you can see uh, just a little bit of where the brickwork starts to the right-hand side of this picture uh, back here. Uh, this is from 1903, and it was such an important bit of infrastructure when it opened that Mayor Lowe actually had himself lowered into a construction shaft in a car at the time so he could drive through the sewer, just as a publicity event. But uh, it shows that th this sort of thing had a much broader public uh, awareness at the time, at late 19th, early 20th century, when we were building this sort of underground infrastructure. In the mid 20th century, we decided we didn't want all this sewage and, uh, and wastewater being dumped out directly into the New York Bay. So uh, the end of this sewer line was connected to an interceptor sewer so it could be sent to a treatment plant. That works most of the time. Still, any time we get much rain at all, it overflows straight out into New York Bay, as it did when it was first built. Um, what, what I spend a lot of my time doing is trying to track down lost streams. Most, or all cities are uh, grown up around waterways, right? So this is the old Fleet River in London, a tributary to the Thames. And uh, it's been an important waterway in London since Roman times, and it's been above ground for most of that. For more than a thousand years, it was an important waterway for shipping in and out of the city. Ships would come in on the Thames and come up the Fleet River. But it got more and more uh, stagnant and uh, stinky as time went on, and it became an unofficial sewer until it became an official sewer and was put underground in this magnificent tunnel. I didn't start off going into sewers. I don't think anybody starts off doing that. But uh, like a lot of people, I, my first uh, fascination with the urban underground came through New York subway tunnels. So this is the old City Hall station, the flagship station, when the subway was first opened and abandoned um, since the 1940s. Uh, going around the world, I see a lot of different kinds of, uh, of underground spaces. This is underneath Paris. Paris, for the past thousand years, has been mining out limestone from underneath the city to build those great churches that we see on uh, the surface. And so this is part of that network of limestone quarry tunnels. They've been reused in various ways. And so this section was reused as a uh, bomb shelter uh, and then has become a party space for the cataphiles or the lovers of the catacombs. Uh, big underground spaces, of course, are wonderful. So uh, places like Odessa in Ukraine and um, uh, cities in, in uh, Eastern Europe have these magnificent medieval looking spaces. Very contemporary cities also have their uh, massive underground infrastructure spots as well. This is underneath Stockholm, Sweden, where uh, they're continuing today to dig these hundreds of kilometers of uh, tunnels through the granite bedrock. 
uh, to carry all the utilities. This is actually part of the official escape route for the King of Sweden if, they, if Stockholm is ever attacked. But it also carries uh, giant steam tunnels. District steam heating is used around the world because it's more efficient than having individual buildings have to do their own heating. It was a system that was invented uh, in New York, and uh, we have steam tunnels like that underneath the city all over the place. This is uh, uh, steam and utility tunnels underneath New York. And then, of course, as I started going through these different layers, I found that the, the archaeology of a city is, is present uh, in its underground. As you dig through these layers, you see the history of a city, everything from these old train tunnels. So this is New York now. This is uh, the Atlantic Avenue Tunnel, an abandoned uh, railroad tunnel. Um, freight railroads in Manhattan, no longer used as uh, uh, we don't really make things in Manhattan anymore. We don't need the, the freight traffic. Um, some of these old abandoned spaces, of course, have then been reused in different ways, and some of them have become homes to people who live in these spaces. So all of this I just found fascinating over time, and uh, hopefully this shows you a little bit of, of what uh, <laughs> is cool about, about it all, why it's worthwhile going down and seeing these spaces. Um, now, if you happen to start researching the urban underworld, the urban underground, there's something kind of interesting that comes up. It's a lot easier to find uh, mythology about the underground than it is to find realities about it, right? This is actually, this is a real challenge if you are, say, uh, you know, a college student come to New York and trying to look up uh, helpful information that will help you find your way into tunnels. It's, it's very difficult. You find all sorts of stuff that will tell you about how to find zombies, but not much about real tunnels. And according to this stuff that you find out there, this, these mythological resources, the popular consciousness, the underground is full of monsters and dead people and whatnots. And, and all of these dead people underground and these monsters are all out to get you. So that, that's one thing that I think is really interesting and really kind of weird. And then the other thing I found out over time is that it's kind of true. The underground is full of dead people. I mean, not all, not all over the place, but you know, there, <laughs> there's a lot of them. <laughs> so this is a uh, uh, just, just a couple sort of random examples I pulled. Uh, this is the, the crypt of the Capuchin monks underneath Rome. Uh, Rome actually is where we get the term catacomb from the uh, early Christian burial areas on the outskirts of Rome. And uh, Christian burial customs have actually led to, uh, that, that's one of the, the big reasons why there are so many dead people underground in urban areas around the world because of the uh, Interment practices uh, around Catholic burials. Um, and of course, you find more dead people underground in cities that have existed for a long time. So European cities with centuries of history have centuries of people that have been there in those cities and had to be interred over time. It, just like other sorts of urban processes, uh, Mortality is kind of a, one sort of urban infrastructure, right? Just like sewage or waste disposal. In fact, it's one of those processes that is ongoing. But even in a city like New York, where we really only have a couple hundred years of history uh, of a city with the real high population density that we think of when we think of New York, uh, we still have many more cemeteries and mausoleums than can possibly be maintained according to the ways that was planned when they were first set up, right? So we have abandoned cemetery areas and abandoned maus mausoleums all over the place. Uh, and so as I was exploring these urban layers over time, I, you know, it, it went from being a kind of a surprising thing to just kind of being part of what I saw in the urban fabric. And in fact, there are areas around the New York coastline where the, uh, the waterfront embankments are made up of old tombstones, right? Because over generations and over centuries, this is one of the, the uh, processes that just has to happen, right? There's limited space in any urban environment. 
in a city like Paris, which is much, much older than New York, and it has a very geographically uh, small area to deal with, centuries and centuries of people dying and being put in the ground eventually filled up all of the cemeteries on the surface of the city. And that was a problem because then the churches didn't have any more cemetery plots to sell. So in uh, the 1700s, somebody had a bright idea and said, you know all those old limestone quarry tunnels? We could consecrate some of those and start putting the, uh, um, the skeletons from the overfilled cemeteries underground. So there are, uh, out of the hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of tunnels underneath Paris, there are many, many kilometers that are now ossuaries filled up with the skeletons of about seven million Parisians from the past uh, thousand years or so. And so, just by comparison, there's about one million Parisians on the surface alive today. So, uh, not a good place to be when the zombie apocalypse hits. And it, it's a little disconcerting at first, but after a while, as I say, you know, it just becomes part of what is there in these urban layers, and uh, crawling around on the remains of dead people is, um, you know, strange, but uh, I, uh, I kind of figured after a while it's no weirder than, say, walking across Washington Square Park, which, of course, uh, 200 years ago was a potter's field, and there are human remains underneath there now, and we're just separated by a few feet of dirt. So I mention all this because it came as a real surprise to me then, one day when I was, uh, or one night when I was uh, crawling through a small tunnel in New York, and uh, I came across a dead body and it scared the shit out of me. And uh, I, I knew that it was not uh, statistically anything like the seven million skeletons in Paris, it was just one. Hadn't been dead nearly as long either, and that was part of what made it much scarier. And for some reason, my first reaction was to turn off the light. <laughs> that did not help at all, because of course, that was what immediately came to mind. And so, and then that was one of the, uh, the three most scared moments I've ever had underground. Uh, and then, you know, uh, I turned my light back on, and because I am who I am, I snapped a couple pictures before I faced another scary moment, which was trying to figure out how to go and talk to the police about this and how to explain that I'd been somewhere maybe I wasn't supposed to be, and uh, then the whole issue of how to get detectives in suits into this small, dirty tunnel, and uh, I th a learning experience for everybody, I think. But uh, <laughs> I mentioned this because... Uh, one thing that came up in thinking about this was uh, uh, that adventure and the experience of exploration is not necessarily mapped out to the cosmic import or the, uh, the statistical uh, aspects of, of the environment that we're going into, right? It doesn't matter how many skeletons there are, it matters how it feels to me. It doesn't matter how big the space is, it matters my experience of the space, right? I had a very intense experience there of exploring that urban environment. And sometimes I have the experience of exploring in a very small urban river, right? Much greater than my experience of exploring Niagara Falls when I go there and I just do the tourist experience. So, I, I, want, I want you just to, to keep that in mind, that adventure and exploration is a subjective and personal experience, right? So hold that thought. So now back to urban hydrological infrastructure. So when I started uh, poking around the different layers of New York, I didn't just go underground. I was fascinated by the peaks, the urban peaks as well, and I started going up when I could. I climbed the bridges around Manhattan. This is uh, going up the Queensboro Bridge. Uh, the view from the Williamsburg Bridge looking out over Manhattan. And so going up and getting these vantage points, I was able to see something that we all know. Uh, this is a city built on islands, right? But even though I had known that, I hadn't really felt what that meant, 
because my experience on a day-to-day -day basis is not the experience of living on islands. I don't hop in a boat to go between Manhattan and Brooklyn where I live. I just get on the subway or I just get in my car and I drive. The bridges and the subway tunnels, those are infrastructure that we have used to reshape the topography. Right? We have really created an entirely different experience of the topography of our environment through this massive infrastructure. This is the Park Avenue Bridge, one of my favorites, because in fact it was uh, the first uh, railroad connection between Manhattan Island and mainland America. And the Bronx is the only borough connected to the mainland. And so this map here uh, from 1840 shows what it looked like back when New York was just at the very bottom of Manhattan Island and there was one rail line, and this is the Park Avenue Bridge. The current uh, metal structure that we see is not the original Park Avenue Bridge, but it's on the same site, so it's uh, uh, the successor, and, um, and, you know, spiritually, it's the same bridge. And then, of course, the, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge, the great granddaddy of them all, looking out over lower Manhattan. And so this is then uh, a, an engraving showing a bird's eye view from 1844, and we can see what it looked like before there were any of those bridge connections. So infrastructure, reshaping topography on a big scale, those bridges, those are what the city has used to reshape our environment to, to deal with waterways on a really big scale. And ultimately, what all this shows is that, uh, I think, is that our day-to-day -day experience of the city is highly limited. We, we generally interact with the city as if it's a two-dimensional thing, right? This is Times Square. We can think of a city when we look at a map. That's one way to look at a city as a two-dimensional thing. Another is just to walk through it at street level. And this is the view we get when we walk through at street level. But I think this would be a more accurate representation of a city environment, right? Where we have Times Square, but above and below it is all of the infrastructure layers that allow it to be what it is. Drainage, because it wouldn't be Times Square if it was flooded, and uh, it wouldn't be Times Square if it didn't have people, so you have the bridges connecting it and the subways, and you have to have water supply, and it wouldn't be Times Square without the bright lights of Broadway, so you have to have electrical connections, and et cetera, et cetera. So, bridges, big infrastructure, that's how we deal with the major waterways that we can still see, but, what about all of the, the little waterways that used to exist? The ones that allowed New York to start growing here when it first started growing, right? Because we can't drink the water from the Hudson or the East River or the New York Bay. That's all salt water because it's connected to the ocean, all tidally affected. So when, um, when the Dutch first settled here, it, was only possible because there was uh, a really rich variety of freshwater sources. And this is a, a 19th century map where a hydrological engineer took the pre-urban uh, map of the city and overlaid that with the street grid from 1811, which is what we have today, and um, uh, traced out all these old streams showing how they related to the city today. And I've been over the past few years trying to trace down as many as I could and see where they still exist because the processes that form these still exist in the city today as they do in all cities. So what I found is that most of these waterways have been routed into sewers but they do absolutely still exist and even as we're bringing in fresh water from 100 miles away and paying to treat our sewage we still have this fresh water flowing in the city. Places like Sunsway Creek which uh, flowed through Queens above ground. It's now a mainline sewer here. But you can still see groundwater flowing in from these natural springs. Uh, canal Street was a canal before it was a street. It was drained the fresh water from the collect pond. And Spring Street was named Spring Street because there was a natural spring there. And uh, that flows in to the Canal Street sewer. Uh, and actually, that flow of water has carved out a new tunnel around the pipe that was originally built to contain it. And the more I looked, the more I found that these are all over the place. On this uh, 19th century map, you can see the little area where it shows natural springs. And sure enough, in the 1940s, storm drain there in Queens, that, that uh, natural spring water has forced its way through a crack in the concrete and fountains in. 
So all of this stuff is kind of interesting just as historic trivia. The question you always have to ask when you're doing historic research is, does it matter? It doesn't matter to us today, and I think it absolutely does because this is the sort of history that if you don't pay attention to it, it ends up flooding your basement, sometimes doing even worse. This is a case where it has flooded somebody's basement. This is the NYU Law School Library where they didn't pay attention to that uh, 19th century map, and uh, sure enough, as they were digging down, it started flooding uh, in their sub-basement, so they have that active sump pump going. This is the sort of thing I absolutely love, and so I try to get it into these slideshows whenever I can, even though I know it's pushing everybody's patience to, to show these beautiful things I worked so long on. But this is mapping, or the, these things are mapping out the historic uh, watershed of the Mineta Brook in Greenwich Village onto the contemporary sewer grid, because the Mineta Brook is one of these streams that's almost completely disappeared and the only way to figure out what's going on with that fresh water today is to try to map it out over the sewer grid. It doesn't, it, it, its flow is not quite as apparent as it is in some other places, like for example, Los Angeles, where you have uh, the 19th century waterways that are invisible on the surface, but that reappear very clearly every time it rains, which is essentially once a year, but with devastating force. So, why should we explore and pay attention to this? And uh, Los Angeles is a more extreme example. New York, we only really get flooded out at uh, really catastrophic tropical storms, right? Those don't happen very often. LA has managed to get catastrophic floods about every seven years. And since nobody in LA can manage to remember anything more than about seven years, it keeps on happening. And so this uh, animation shows 1890 to 1980, the construction of massive storm drain tunnels. I love this because all, I only put into this map storm drain tunnels that are big enough for me to walk in. The older I get, the more I hate crouching down through little tunnels. So I love this because it shows how much there is to explore underground. This also shows, though, that each generation that has tried to build infrastructure to avoid flooding has tried to solve that problem. And then as more urbanization has taken place, flooding has reoccurred and they've had to do new construction after that. So by not paying attention to what's going on underground, we leave ourselves open to environmental catastrophe, not because nature is doing something different, but because we keep on building cities, we keep on developing and putting more people in these places. So that leads back to the adventure part of it. We have this idea that exploration and adventure is something that takes place outside of cities. If we want to go see a sparkling stream, we go upstate, for example. And I want to suggest to all of you, we don't need to do that. Explore in your own backyard, because it is the intensity of the individual experience that is the adventure and the exploration. And because today, in fact, the majority of people in the world live in urban environments, and so it is actually meaningful to explore those environments and try to understand how they work. So by having those individual experiences, and they become intense very quickly, anybody who's rafted through an underground river will remember how that thing is flowing. But you don't even, I know, I know that no matter what, even if I tell all of you, please explore sewers, I know, that's a hard sell. <laughs> but remember that difference between the seven million skeletons under Paris and that, that intense experience, one dead body. I think that just by occasionally peering down and seeing that sparkling trickle of water flow underneath one manhole cover, we can sometimes experience the delight of seeing a stream flow just as we could out in uh, uh, you know, uh, the mountainous nature that we think of when we normally think of exploration. So please go out, explore. Have fun, stay safe, and please do it so that I don't look as crazy when I am doing it. Enjoy and happy exploring. Mm -hmm.